Hi, and welcome. These are a series of notes on Michael Macarius's book titled Ruins. The book focuses on visual arts relationship to and depictions of ruins mainly within Western culture. I'll take a focused look on concepts and ideas that seemed interesting within the first chapter from the text. However, I won't go through all of the content within the chapter itself. If you find the content in this video interesting, you're welcome to follow along as I create a video for each section. I'll also have a link to the book itself in the description below. The section we'll take a look at is titled Ruins in Renaissance Painting. It's important to note that a key characteristic of the Renaissance was a gradual recovery of pre-Christian culture and that this became progressively prevalent over time. It was a sort of secularization that um, progressively rejoined the Latin civilizations of the past to mark the onset of a modern period in culture at the time. It's interesting to note that this was achieved through a process of reversal and looking backwards in order to revise and progress forward into the future. And this process holds ruins as both past and present entities by both expressing a fascination with the past and affirming the currency of previous models that both positions and measures itself with the present and future. The people of this time thought of themselves as if they were in a new age or era apart from medieval times and subsequently adjacent to antiquity. This general time period can be viewed from about the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe. The past, in this sense, is perceived from a distance, and distinct periods of time are formed for how culture might be perceived. We can see a lot of this kind of activity today as well, if we just take a moment to think through this idea. As much as depictions of ruins are about architecture and depictions of physical depth, or a lack thereof, they, are al they also position a painting, for example, in a narrative light that is as much about temporal depth and time. In other words, something far away is both physically distant and also far away in time. Finally, to depict the antique is to take it from its original context and focus on it in an isolated and curated manner. With these ideas in mind, let's take some time to focus on one such painting within this section. We'll focus on Andrea Montaigne's Saint Sebastian. It's a painting that was finished in 1480 and is currently in the Louvre in Paris. There are three versions of this painting that were created by the same artist, but we'll be focusing on the painting created in 1480. Briefly for context, Montaigne was an early Renaissance master from Padua and lived in a period of time of frequent illness and, and plagues. As a brief note, St. Sebastian was widely associated with the cure for plagues and illnesses, especially throughout the Italian peninsula. The painting was part of the altar of San Zeno in Verona, Italy. The story of St. Sebastian, who died in 288 AD in Rome, is one in, it in which he was a martyr who was killed during the persecution of Christians by the Roman Emperor Diocletian. When it was discovered that St. Sebastian, who was a Praetorian guard, was also a Christian, Diocletian ordered that St. Sebastian be tied to a post and shot to death by arrows. The story itself is more nuanced and complex than what I'm describing here. 
However, for the purposes of viewing this painting, it seems to be enough context for now. The picture presumably illustrates the theme of God's athlete, with St. Sebastian tied to a Corinthian column and arc. As a viewer, we would be observing the painting from an unusual, low perspective used by the artist. Part of this comes from the scale of the painting itself, which is 255 centimeters tall and 140 centimeters wide. In approximate terms, it's about 8.5 feet tall and 4.5 feet wide. As a viewer, we would be looking up towards St. Sebastian, who in return is looking up towards the sky and the heavens. The figure of St. Sebastian is also somewhat larger in scale relative to the column, and we can get a sense of the relationship between the martyr and the column as a representation of a previous culture. Just as a quick side note, it's also important to point out that from the column there is a growth of plants, both in the form of ivy above Sebastian's head and a small fig tree near his feet. I thought that there were a couple of paragraphs from the book that described this painting in a wonderfully concise way, so I'll read these paragraphs. They're located on pages 22, 24, and 39 in the book. The column of Corinthian pattern to which Sebastian is tied occupies the height of the entire picture and thus governs the various planes in the image. By depicting in the near foreground the archers leaving the scene, their work done, and by excavating the picture space into a, a rocky landscape where an entryway to an ancient city echoes the martyr's column, the artist situates events in a seamless narrative of the picture, originating and develop, developing in the Quattrocento vision of time that embraces past, present, and future as implied indeed by the figurative meaning of perspective, prospect, and what the future holds. In this context, antique ruins in a religious scene take on precise symbolic meaning, the defeat of paganism faced with the advent of Christ. In addition to the victory of Christianity over paganism conveyed by the columns in his two St. Sebastians. In the Louvre version, Mantegna also adds, close to the blood-soaked foot of the martyr, a sculptural remnant, a foot in marble. The mineral fragment suggests a specific interpretation related to an episode in Jacopus de uh, Voragin's uh, hagiography in The Golden Legend, in which Sebastian is supposed to have smashed more than 200 statues of idols. It may also be juxtaposed with the description of the Black Death given by Giovanni Vellini. The description reads as such, men and women and every animal left alive resembled a dead statue as if turned to marble. This mirrors Montaigne's general tendency to mineralize bodies, in particular Sebastian, whose sculptural appearance has been remarked upon. Out of this rocky world grows plants, Christian symbols, ivy figuring fidelity and the resurrection, while the fig tree represents spiritual fruitfulness. If Montaigne is patently not the only painter to introduce ruins into painting, his profound familiarity with classical monuments is relevant here. Antique ruins depicted by painters thus involve several different levels of meaning. 
viewed from a strictly religious perspective, they denote a pagan past condemned without redemption. But this explicit message is accompanied by a further hidden significance. Lurking behind this state of ruin, it is the return of the antique, not of religious figures themselves, that signals the onset of a new era. Emblems of a culture to which from the Renaissance on constant reference was to be made, ruins thus connote a vision of time which they embody in the space of representation. And with that, we'll end section one of Macarius's book, Ruins. If you like this content, please like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, thanks for listening.